I wanted to get us talking about magnetic equivalence, which is sort of a uh, counterpart to our discussion of chemical equivalence. And then we're going to uh, move on to discuss spin systems and we'll work in what's called topal notation or a way of describing spin systems, which I think will be, be useful. So I'm going to dive in by writing out a few definitions because I think it's I think it's useful, um, and then I will do so further. I think it helps uh, helps prevent uh, prevent conclusions. What I'm going to do in today's lecture, as I was was alluding to the other day, is basically teach you that much of what you learned in uh, sophomore organic chemistry about describing coupling patterns is a lie, or at least it's an oversimplification, but fortunately an oversimplification that we can get away with most of the time. And what I'm gonna do is take us through some really hairy examples today where that oversimplification breaks down. So you can see how at least, you know, in the cases that behave, which is most of them, like the rules you learned in sophomore organic chemistry, the splitting rules, um, you'll at least understand, okay, we are sort of on the edge here. So let me start with the idea of magnetic equivalence. So I have gotta write this out that two protons are magnetically equivalent if they are chemically equivalent And from Monday, you remember that two protons are chemically equivalent if they're interchangeable by a symmetry operation or rapid process. So we talked about reflection through a plane, or we talked about a cyclohexane ring flip on plain old cyclohexane without a methyl group as examples of respectively a symmetry operation or rapid process. But then we have extra criteria for chemical equivalence. So I'm going to add in, and they have the same geometrical relationships. So all other protons in, or I should say nuclei, in the spin system. And by nuclei, of course, I mean spin active nuclei. And so some of the examples I'll be showing will have fluorine, which is a million miles apart in chemical shift, it's not even in the same spectrum, but it is spin-spin coupled just like protons. And that is to all other nuclei in the spin system. So that brings us to our second term that I want to define, which is a spin system. And a spin system is a complete set of nuclei in which members are coupled.
Now these words that I've written out are pretty abstract sounding. And I think easy, easy to be confused about, but the best way to learn something is by example. So let me start with a couple of simple examples. So let's start with propyl ethyl ether. So here's propyl ethyl ether, ethyl propyl ether. So you have a CH, three CH2 group, an ethyl group, and you have a CH2, CH2, CH3 group. And each of these are isolated from each other. And what I mean about, by isolated is simply that the hydrogens on this CH2 group are four bonds away from the hydrogens on this CH2 group, except for cases of long range coupling, usually involving an intervening double bond, we don't typically see coupling through four bonds. In other words, you have hydrogen to carbon, carbon to oxygen, oxygen to carbon, carbon to hydrogen. So this is one spin system. And we'll get into nomenclature in just a moment, but it's what's called an A3X2 spin system. And this is another spin system. The propyl group is another spin system. And it's what we would call an A3M M prime X X prime system. And again, this is going to make more sense in just a moment. All right, let's try another example. And I'm going to ask you to identify the spin systems and the nuclei in it. So we had talked about phenylalanine the other day when I introduced the spectrum of it briefly and we, we got to at least see the H1 NMR spectrum of phenylalanine. And I think what I will do here is I will draw out all the hydrogens. I'm not going to indicate stereochemistry or maybe I'll at least show a wedge here to indicate that this is the the S stereochemistry, it doesn't much matter. So who can identify one spin system in this molecule, in this acetylphenylalanine methylamide? Uh, that arrow ring is gonna be one. That arrow ring is going to be one spin system, indeed. The hydrogens on the ring are coupled to each other, but with slight, slight, slight exception, they're not coupled to these hydrogens here, the benzylic hydrogens here. You can argue that there's a minuscule, teeny tiny long range coupling between the ortho hydrogens and the beta hydrogens. Um, and later on, I'll show you examples where it's so small that you can't see splitting, but you can see the lines are ever so slightly broader due to about a half hertz of coupling. But for the purposes now, absolutely, let's treat this phenyl ring as isolated. It is one spin system. Who can pick another spin system in this molecule? Each of the terminal methyl groups. Each of the terminal methyl groups. This is a spin system here. Is the methyl group here a spin system on its own? Does it depend on if the H is uh, 
coming on and off real quick, something like that? Yes, it depends on whether the H is coming on and off real quick. In general, on an amide, the hydrogen will stay on for a substantial amount of time. In an organic solvent like chloroform, the hydrogen on an amide, so it's a little different for amines, but for an amide, the hydrogen will stay attached. It won't undergo chemical exchange rapidly. In aqueous solution, in H2O, at Typically at lower pHs, the hydrogen will also stay attached for a good long time. And so again, you'll see spin-spin coupling at very high pH, it will exchange rapidly. And in D2O, it may be on the laboratory time scale on the order of minutes replaced by deuterium that has very little coupling. But for most intents and purposes, we would call the methyl amide group a spin system. In other words, you would expect to see the methyl group split into a doublet and the hydrogen split into a quartet. All right, last spin system. Anyone want to name it or guide me on it? Yeah, so like the CH2, CH, NH. Exactly. So again, under all normal circumstances that we would encounter, this NH would be part of the spin system. These two hydrogens we've already discussed are diastereotopic. They're not going to be the same as each other. They'll probably appear at slightly different chemical shift. The big, these are the beta hydrogens. The alpha hydrogen will appear far away and the NH will appear far away. And we'll continue with popal notation in a moment, but I'm going to write now that this would be described as an ABMX spin system. We generally use letters that are close together to describe protons that are close in chemical shift, and then letters like, that are far away like M or X to describe protons that are further away in chemical shift. All right, so that sort of sets the stage. I want to now, now that we understand what a complete set of nuclei is that are coupled to each other, I want to give us a few examples on magnetically equivalent and magnetically inequivalent protons. Don't worry if you don't yet understand all of that popal notation I wrote, we're going to get this reinforced in the next part of our you know, as we progress through here. So I think the first example I'll give here is 2,6-dichloro terfutyl benzene, nice, simple molecule. We're just going to focus on the spin system on the benzene ring. The terfutyl group, of course, is its own spin system. We don't generally worry about chlorine. I said chlorine is a quadrupolar nucleus, both chlorine 35 and chlorine 37. And for that reason, it pretty much doesn't participate in spin-spin coupling. So we have three hydrogens here, and we see that the hydrogens that are next to the chlorines are clearly interchangeable by a symmetry of. There's a plane of symmetry in the molecule. And so at that sophomore level of chemical equivalence, it's very easy for us to say this hydrogen is the same as this hydrogen. Now, I said we're going to get a different question now. We're going to get the question of magnetic equivalence. And so we look at the relationship of these two hydrogens to other hydrogens in the spin system. And we ask, do they have, do these two chemically equivalent hydrogens have the same geometrical relationship 
to hydrogens in the spin system. And you can kind of see, and maybe my arrows here illustrate the geometrical relationship. This hydrogen says, oh yeah, I'm ortho to this hydrogen. And this hydrogen says, oh yeah, I'm ortho to this hydrogen. I'm 120 degrees away or you know, whatever you want to say, I guess 60 degrees away around, around the circle. And so you would say these two underlined hydrogens are magnetically equivalent. And that allows us to say, yes, they're the same at both levels. Hydrogens that are magnetically equivalent allow us, if you have a spin system in which all the hydrogens that are chemically equivalent are also magnetically equivalent, those basic rules of sophomore organic chemistry that you learned really do apply. So we could describe this spin system as an A2X spin system if the hydrogens are far apart. In other words, if the difference in chemical shift between these hydrogens and this hydrogen is, I'd say, more than a couple of a tenth of a ppm, or I'll say A2X spin system or we could call it an A to B spin system if, if they are closer in chemical shift, if they're right near each other. And the main difference is going to be, at least here, whether you start to see distortion in the peaks. If you start to see, if you uh, have them far apart, then what you're going to see is something like this. So where you would see a doublet, I'm gonna take the full length of the board here. You would see a doublet for the two ortho hydrogens and far, far, far away, you would see a triplet, a one to two to one triplet. I'm gonna try to draw my J values, my coupling constants, the same. So this would be sort of A2X. You may have heard the term AB pattern for two hydrogens before. And of course, I talked about an ABMX system. If these two hydrogens, if their chemical shifts are closer, then the multiplets will start to tent into each other or distort in shape, and you'll see the inner line of the triplet will get a little taller than you would otherwise expect. And the outer line would be a little shorter. I always like to sort of think of it this way as tenting in. I guess I'll try to try to reflect the relative heights here. And so we would call this an A to B system, but basically the, dis the difference is whether they are far apart or close together. Thoughts or questions at this point? Let's try another example. Let's try difluoromethane. And ask the same question. And of course, although you would probably see it drawn out flat, in terms of thinking about geometry, we all know that carbon is tetrahedral. And so I would probably want if we're thinking about geometrical relationships, I'd probably want to try to draw wedges and dashes to indicate that if the fluorines are in the plane of the whiteboard, one of the hydrogens is pointing out and one of the hydrogens is pointing back. 
So the first question I have is, what are the nuclei in this spin system? What are the nuclei that are participating in spin-spin coupling? Um, can't the fluorines couple too? Right? Absolutely. The fluorines couple too. So even though the hydrogens are in the H1 NMR spectrum, let's say at 500 megahertz on 117,500 Gauss magnet, and the fluorines are at 470 megahertz, not even in the same spectrum, not parts per million away, but miles away, tens of megahertz away, they're all part of a spin system. And so we have the two hydrogens are chemically equivalent. They're exchangeable by a symmetry operation. And the two fluorines are chemically equivalent. They're exchangeable by the symmetry operation. What about the geometrical relationship of this hydrogen to each of these fluorines? Is the hydrogen pointing out seeing those two fluorines in the same way? I think so. Yeah, yeah, indeed. And the hydrogen pointing back is seeing them in the same way. So this is clearly an A2X2 spin system. We don't have to worry about Bs, they're a mile apart, but most importantly, these two hydrogens are not only chemically equivalent, but magnetically equivalent. These two fluorines are not only chemically equivalent, but magnetically equivalent. James. Yeah. Before we move on to the next example, do you mind if I ask a question about the previous one? Yeah. So A to B, that makes sense because when they're close enough that you can see tenting, you use letters that are close to one another. What's the difference between A M or A X? Why would you choose one letter over the other? So I would normally you would choose A and X, but if you need a third letter, you choose the middle of the alphabet for M. So if I had maybe two things that were close in chemical shift and another two things that are close in chemical shift, I might call it A, B, X, Y. If I had two things that are close in chemical shift and then another two things that are close in chemical shift and one is far away, I might call it A2, M2, X or very often a system like that would be A, A prime, M, M prime, X. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's try one more spin system. Let's take an alene. And I've deliberately written this to be confusing because that's how you'd see it written in a paper. But I will remind us that if one pi system is in the plane of the board, the other pi system is going to be orthogonal. And so if I really want to write the geometry in a way that's more reflective, These two hydrogens point out of the board and back into the board. And so just like our trifluoro, our difluoromethane example, these two hydrogens end up having a geometrical relationship to this hydrogen that's the same. So this also would be A to B or A to X. And remember, we have intervening double bonds. So even though it's four bonds away, we're going to see some spin-spin coupling across the system. And generally, 
generally, it's going to be pretty obvious. And the difference, if it isn't obvious, maybe maybe don't worry. It's you know both right answers here, A to B or A to X. But the general rule of thumb might be far, you know, in other words, A's and X's would be for delta, um, for delta nu over J to be on, uh, let's say, greater than 10. And that's sort of a, an approximately greater. In other words, if this distance of the coupling constant is less than, you know, if the separation of these two lines in Hertz is less than about 10 times the coupling constant, we would say they're far apart. Or put simply, if you look at this distance here, this coupling, and you sort of go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you'd say, oh, this is far away. Oh, wait, these are kind of close. One, two, three, four. And I just since a typical coupling constant is on the order of seven hertz and a typical NMR spectrometer might be 300 to 600 megahertz, where a tenth of a hertz is 30 hertz or 60 hertz, we might say generally a simple rule of thumb would be greater than about 0.1 or maybe let's just say I'll be conservative about 2.2 ppm. Uh, so sort of a, a loose greater than 0.2 ppm for a typical modern NMR spectrometer. All right. So these are all first order spin systems. These all basically follow the rules of sophomore organic chemistry that you've learned and everything is hunky dory. I wanna show you in a moment through example, just how bad it can get. And we're gonna look at a contrast between, um, between what you would expect and what what you actually get. And so I'll show you two sort of classic, classic examples of things where, where you might end up thinking, okay, these should behave in simple ways and they don't. So let's take a look at difluoroethylene. And in difluoroethylene, you'd say, well, clearly these two hydrogens are chemically equivalent to each other. There's a plane of symmetry. And clearly these two fluorines are chemically equivalent. There's a plane of symmetry. But then if you looked, you'd say, okay, this hydrogen says, oh, I'm cis to this fluorine. This hydrogen says, oh, I'm trans to that fluorine. So these two hydrogens aren't magnetically equivalent. And ditto, the fluorines look at this hydrogen and one says I'm cis, one says I'm trans. They're not magnetically equivalent. They're still a mile apart. The hydrogens are in the 500 megahertz region. The fluorines are in the 470 megahertz region. They're not on the same spectrum. The hydrogens are in their proton NMR spectrum. The fluorines are in their fluorine NMR spectrum. So it's an A, A prime, X, X prime system. James, I thought maybe they would be magnetically equivalent because even if they're cis and trans to each other, the other could say the same thing because the, the fluorines are the same. The other could say the same thing, but that's not the test we're applying here. <sighs> Indeed, you could say, oh, this hydrogen says I'm cis to one fluorine and I'm trans to the other. Mm -hmm. And this hydrogen says I'm cis to one fluorine and I'm trans to another. And that's essentially the test of chemical equivalence. I'm going to show you just how bad the bad gets when we look at the spectra. Because these two hydrogens, when they look at one fluorine, this fluorine says, I'm special, I'm unique. How do you see me? And this fluorine says, I'm special, I'm unique. And how do you see me? 
And this hydrogen says, I see you as cis, and this one says, I see you as trans. And we have the same situation in an ortho di substituted aromatic. I'll take ortho di chlorobenzene, but I'll show you a slightly different example. I'll show you phthalate. These two hydrogens here, clearly interchangeable by a symmetry operation. These two hydrogens here, clearly interchangeable by a symmetry operation. There's a plane in the molecule. And yet again, with the same, same test, this hydrogen says, oh, I'm ortho to you. This hydrogen says, oh, I'm meta to you. So this is an A, a prime X, X prime system, or if they're close in chemical shift, A, A prime B, B prime. And all of those rules that you thought you knew from sophomore organic chemistry can go out the window. They can, they don't always, often you can get away with what we call a pseudo first order system, but they can go out the window. And to show you just how extreme it can be, I'll look at our handout. Spectra that I'm showing here were taken a long time ago. They were taken on what's called a continuous wave instrument. So these little wigglies here on the side called ringing, these little things here, essentially are an artifact of how the instrument was collected. So this first spectrum, this is an H1 NMR spectrum, and it's of difluoromethane, and you see a triplet. In other words, in the H1 NMR spectrum, our A2, X2 spin system, the protons, behave just like you would expect, a one to two to one triplet. Now, here's the H1 NMR spectrum, the proton NMR spectrum of difluoroethane. And you look at this and what the heck, how do you describe this? You cannot easily describe this multiplet. In other words, those two hydrogens, oops, those two hydrogens that we said are chemically equivalent, but not magnetically equivalent, are split in a way that defies the description of a simple multiplet all the rules for this compound that you thought you knew from sophomore organic chemistry go out the window. Thoughts or questions? So if you've got one of these um, like higher order systems with the uh, magnetically inequivalent protons, um, are you basically saying you can't predict the splitting pattern really? Well, you can't with, let's say, pencil and paper. And the good news, good news is actually there's software. It comes from various types of energy level calculations because you have much more complicated energy pathways for transitions between spin states. Um, the NMR spectrometer does have a program that will calculate the coupling patterns. So you can easily use software to do it, but all pencil and paper rules go out the window. Now, if we look at ortho, this is dioctyl phthalate. And the reason I'm showing dioctyl phthalate, it's another diortho. Can't write and talk at the same time. It's a diortho substituted benzene, 
but it's a common plasticizer that's used in Tigon tubing. And if you use Tigon tubing for your Schlenk line, the solvents in the vapors are going to extract the dialectyl phthalate. It'll ooze into your flask. And so many people have come to me with a spectrum and said, what is this stuff in my reaction? And it's the plasticizer. And the pattern that we see here, we see two multiplets, but again, and I've expanded them over here. Again, the multiplets, these are for the ortho protons, are very hard to describe. And even though they're far apart in chemical shift, um, basically no simple pattern would describe this. And this is an example of an A, A prime, X, X prime spin system. If they're a little closer, you might call it A, A prime, B, B prime, but no matter what, it doesn't get better than this. If I did this, this is a 300 megahertz NMR spectrum. If I did this at 800 megahertz, this pattern would be the same. You might see a little less tinting of the heights in them toward the inside, but it doesn't get any better. This is a, this is a non first order spin system. Are they always gonna be symmetric like that? Uh, in the case that those are the only partners there, yeah, they will be symmetric. And in the fluorine NMR, here you would see the exact same pattern that you see in the proton NMR. So yeah, the fluorine peaks would look the same. If it were an A, A prime, M, X system, then it were A, A prime, X, X, prime, uh, M, M prime, X system, then you might see slightly different, a lack of symmetry because now the M's might have a different coupling, but the short answer is, yeah, they're gonna look, look kind of similar to each other. I'll, well, I take that back. I take that back. It depends on whether they're coupled to other protons. We'll see some more examples in a second. All right. Now, the good news, look, I've shown you the worst of the worst, but I wanna talk about a very common situation. So the good news is for our, for our methyl group here, when I looked at methyl, when I looked at an ethyl group here, these hydrogens are all equivalent. This is A3 and this is X2. The bad news is in methylene chains, like this. In other words, if you have X, CH2, CH2, Y, these two hydrogens, assuming there are no stereocenters in the molecule, these two hydrogens will be chemically equivalent. But not magnetically equivalent. And ditto for these two hydrogens. They will be chemically equivalent, but not magnetically equivalent. In other words, if we had, let's say, a chlorine here, let's say an oxygen here, and a bromine over here, we would describe this as an A, A prime, X, X prime system. And if it's hard to see that, let me give you a Newman projection here. So I'll write this with a X and H and H. And Y. And if you look here, you have the same situation we had in our dioctyl phthalate in the same situation we had in our difluoroethylene, these two hydrogens are interchangeable by a symmetry operation. There's a plane of symmetry. 
these two hydrogens are interchangeable by a symmetry operation. There's a plane of symmetry. And yet, if I look at the relationship here in this particular Newman projection, one hydrogen says, oh, I'm gauche to, the, to this hydrogen. The other hydrogen says, oh, I'm anti. And that's essentially the same situation. Now, the good news is often, particularly if you're going and you have a large population where y and x are not anti-periplanar to each other, all the rules of sophomore organic chemistry are OK. But often, if you have a locked anti-relationship or a locked gauche relationship, you end up really seeing this effect. And that's what I want to show you next, which is basically to say almost any compound containing CH2 chains, containing two CH2 groups that are adjacent to each other, doesn't strictly behave according to those rules of sophomore organic chemistry. And so I want to want to share some more pages of this handout just to show you how ugly things can get. Normally they won't be this ugly, but there are patterns and when you see them they'll surprise you, but the truth is they don't come up that often. So let me again share my my handout with you. All right, so I've sort of picked these examples over the years. These are things that I've seen in, in my own spectra and I thought they're sort of edifying because people have come to me I, there's a phenyl ring over here, so I'd abbreviated the phenyl ring with a phi, but I, that's kind of my own thing. So basically, this compound has a bulky azulene here. And then it has a CH2 group, a CH2 group, and a phenyl group. And you really, really see in proton A next to the azulene in this methylene chain, you see this breakdown. You can't really describe this as a triplet. For want of a better, better term, I'll call it a goalpost pattern. I don't think anybody else does that. The central methylene group here, B, again, doesn't look like what you would have thought as a sophomore. In other words, it's not a simple quintet. It's a more complicated pattern, but you might overlook this. But this one is pretty distinct. This last CH2, sure, that looks like what you would expect as a sophomore. It looks like a triplet. Maybe you'd say, well, it's not a perfect one to two to one triplet. But basically, this is a case, and you see this particularly with bulky groups that lock you in an anti-periplanar relationship, where this system, so this is an A, A prime, M, M prime, X, X prime system. But, you know, most of the time you could get away saying, okay, what I learned as a sophomore is correct. It would be a doublet a triplet and a triplet and a quintet. But here we see, ah, wait a second, it's not always that case. And this pattern really comes up again and again. Here's another example, very different compound. You've got a bulky TMS group on one end, a not so bulky ammonium group on the other end. The CH2 next to the ammonium group looks pretty much like a triplet but the CH2 group next to the bulky silicon has this same goalpost pattern and the CH2 in the middle is not a simple quintet. It's a very different pattern. And you get reminded of what I said, which is basically, again, we have a system that's not a first order spin system.
want to give you a few more examples. So I've just told you that everything you learned about CH2, CH2 systems is a lie. Usually you can get away with it. And here's a series of homologs. And the breakdown's actually for another sort of reason. And that is that protons have to be dispersed. So if you look at bromopropane, you'd say, okay, that's not not too bad. Everything I learned in sophomore organic chemistry pretty much works. The methyl group is a triplet because it's next to a CH2 group. The methylene is a sextet because it's next to a CH2 and a CH3 group and they split with equivalent couplings. And the next methylene is a triplet because it's next to a CH2 group. And you'd say, okay, bromobutane, same thing. I get a triplet and I get a quintet and I get a sextet and I get a triplet. Everything's fine. As you start to go down to bromopentane, now what happens is these two CH2s end up lumped on top of each other. They end up at the same chemical shift. And we get a situation here, and I'm gonna go all the way down here to where we've got a whole bunch. So I'll go to bromooctane, where you've got bromine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So you've got bromooctane, and basically we see a triplet for this CH2, something that more or less behaves as a quintet for this CH2. The gamma protons are a little bit shifted, but now all of these CH2s here are essentially at the same position. And now as we've gone longer and longer, this methyl group here looks worse and worse. Basically, all of these CH2s are lumped on top of each other, and you see what's called virtual coupling, where the methyl group effectively behaves as if it's coupled to these CH2s, but since the next CH2s are lumped on top of each other, you see additional coupling. The rules of first order coupling that you've learned as a sophomore have broken down. The good news, most of these systems that you look at, you can say, okay, well, it's not really a first order system. I just killed Santa Claus by telling you that no system with CH2 chains is first order. But you look at this and you say, yeah, what I learned in sophomore organic chemistry is good enough, even though it's not first order, you could say it's pseudo first order. In other words, it's a pseudo, I'll say pseudo first order spectrum. In other words, everything that you learned basically still applies, even though I've said, well, you can't always get away with it. But we're starting to see as you get to systems that have higher complexity, things break down. I want to show you one last set of examples because I think it's, it's cool. And it really shows this business of overlapping protons. And it also shows non-chemically equivalent, uh, non-magnetically equivalent protons. So we're gonna start by succinic acid here. Succinic acid, you have four hydrogens. Those hydrogens are chemically equivalent to each other. And so they all appear as a single line. Even though the hydrogens are not magnetically equivalent, they're all chemically equivalent, and so you get a singlet. No surprises here. And then I'll take us to glutaric acid. So glutaric acid has CH2, CH2 with carboxyl groups on the end. And you'd say, okay, I just told you, you can't treat any of these 
CH2, CH2 systems as truly first order, but many of them are going to be pseudo first order. And you look at this and you say, yeah, what I learned as a sophomore applies. The CH2 groups are next to a CH2 group that's different, that's not chemically equivalent. So they each appear as a triplet. The CH2 group in the middle is next to two CH2 groups. It's split by the same coupling. It appears as a quintet. So in other words, everything is fine. Everything is what you learned in sophomore organic chemistry. But now I take us to adipic acid. And adipic acid, you have a CH2 group and a CH2 group with CH2 groups in the middle. And now you look and you say, what the heck is going on with this spectrum? I have the CH2 groups next to the carboxyls are chemically equivalent. The CH2 groups in the middle are chemically equivalent but the coupling doesn't look like anything I'd expect. The CH2 group in the middle sees the adjacent CH2 group, but because it's in a, because the next one is overlapped, we have what we call virtual coupling. We have breakdown of our pseudo first order behavior. We have virtual coupling and this CH2 group looks like a multiplet. In other words, we can't, we can't give a simple description of it. And ditto, these CH2 groups look like multiplets. And this and I won't say odd behavior because I've already told you there's nothing odd about it, but this behavior that defies our expectations, defies everything that we've thought we knew about coupling from sophomore organic chemistry is not a product of, oh, the chain is long, it's a product of these two protons being at the same, these two CH2 groups being at the chemi same chemical shift. We come back to a still longer chain in pamelic acid and you're back to your sophomore comfort zone. The CH2 group that's next to the next CH2 group is a triplet. The CH2 group that's at, I'll call this alpha position, I'll call this beta position. The CH2 groups that are at the beta positions are uh, quintets. And then the CH2 group that's in the middle, well, not quite a sextet, but you probably wouldn't get bent out of shape over it, or not quite a quintet, but you probably wouldn't get bent out of shape over it. It is basically what you'd expect from sophomore organic chemistry. And this pattern that we see when we have protons that are overlapping is not something that's uncommon because many of you have seen THF in your NMR spectra. If you do synthetic chemistry with n-butyl lithium, you probably have used tetrahydrofuran and you might have seen that the hydrogens that are next to the oxygen don't appear as a simple triplet and the hydrogens, so I'll circle these, and the hydrogens that are over here don't appear as a simple triplet. It's just like our example up here with, um, with uh, adipic acid. If you look at those patterns, they're really pretty darn similar. And it's this business of the hydrogens are overlapping. So you get what I call virtual coupling.
Well, this takes us sort of back to our regularly scheduled program. What I mean is now that I've pushed us out of our comfort zone, we're going to return in the next lecture back to our comfort zone of first order analysis of most of the spin systems that we encounter with that little bit of unease reminding us that that first order analysis is on slightly borrowed time and that because we are analyzing these systems in a way that's a simplification, occasionally and in very specific circumstances like long alkyl chains and CH2 groups that are really sterically sort of heavily anti-periplanar and CH2 groups that are overlapping, things may break down. So that's sort of what I wanted to say. We've run a long time, but I will happily take questions or let anyone leave who wants to leave. Um, just to confirm, I guess, is the A referring to the proton and the X referring to the proton next to, I want to say, a halogen group? Because I'm trying to interpret it, but I'm not sure. So we're basically naming the spin system. So yeah, you could say the a protons are the ones at one chemical shift and the X protons are at a far away chemical shift. So in ethanol, which I would describe, or let's take ethyl ether, which I would describe as an A3X2 system, the methyl groups are the A's and the CH2 groups are the X's. CH2 group is the X, the methyl group is the A. In the fluorine system, I might describe the hydrogens like in difluoromethane as the A, we call it A2, and the fluorines as the Xs and call it X2. Honestly, it's arbitrary. I could have named things the other way. Traditionally, I would call uh, ethyl ether an A3X2 system, but there wouldn't be anything per se wrong by calling it an A2X3 system. Ditto in my mind's eye, since I'm kind of proton centric, I think of difluoroethane and I think hydrogens first, um, A2X2 or difluoromethane, I'm sorry. But again, that's simply me being proteocentric. For somebody who thinks in fluorine, maybe they would think, um, think of it the other way. There's not a right or wrong on it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. You're welcome, have a good day. I guess the last thing I'll say is by naming it, we're organizing it in our mind. It's not so much that the name is valuable, it's that by the name, we can wrap our head around it. And that's really the purpose here.